As NASA's focus increases on human deep space exploration, what is to be the fate of the aging International Space Station? And what, if anything, comes after it? Hi, I'm Derek, and my channel Orbital Velocity is all about telling the story of human spaceflight and our journey toward becoming a multi-planetary species. Before beginning, I want to welcome all of my new subscribers and thank those for leaving comments and engaging in live streams. I sincerely appreciate it. Today's topic is about NASA's plans for successors to the International Space Station and how it is part of a path the agency has been trending toward since the mid-2000s, public-private partnerships. The International Space Station, a multinational collaboration between five space agencies in 15 countries, was assembled primarily between 1998 and 2011 using Soyuz and Proton rockets, as well as dozens of space shuttle missions. Some of the early modules are coming up on a quarter century in orbit, while the youngest modules are still more than a decade old. Since November 2000, the outpost has hosted an uninterrupted chain of human crews. That means there are people about to graduate college that have never known a day when at least one Russian cosmonaut and one US astronaut have been in orbit. To me, that's an exciting fact. And if you think so too, be sure to show it by launching that like button into orbit. Now, throughout the last two decades, there have been regular crew sizes ranging from two to seven people. But there has been the occasional surge of up to 13 people during space shuttle visits at the end of the station's construction era. The ISS is already the oldest occupied human habitat in space, and the US recently announced its commitment to extend its operations through 2030. A lot of work remains to be done with all of the station's partner nations in order to ensure funding for maintaining the outpost in a safe manner. However, the continuation of all that research being done is extremely important. According to NASA Administrator Bill Nelson, the International Space Station is a beacon of peaceful international scientific collaboration and for more than 20 years has returned enormous scientific, educational, and technological developments to benefit humanity. The United States' continued participation on the ISS will enhance innovation and competitiveness as well as advance the research and technology necessary to send the first woman and first person of color to the moon under NASA's Artemis program and pave the way for sending the first humans to Mars. According to NASA, during the last two decades, the outpost has hosted more than 3,000 research investigations from over 4,200 researchers across the world. Almost 110 countries have participated in space station activities, which includes more than 1.5 million students per year in activities related to science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. The science data being collected also, according to NASA, is helping with the measurement of drought stress, the health of forests, and the understanding of the interaction of carbon and climate over time. This amazing engineering feat is not only a hub for international cooperation and critical scientific research, it is also a place that is helping foster an emerging low-Earth orbit commercial space market, one that NASA hopes can allow the agency shift more of its resources toward deep space exploration. With NASA beginning to focus on human missions to the moon later this decade, more of its budget will start to shift toward this endeavor. However, the science, access, and opportunities in low Earth orbit still need to be continued, or a so-called destination gap could occur. The way this destination gap occurs is if there is nothing to replace the capability of the ISS once it is deemed too expensive to maintain or unsafe for occupation. It's a sad but true fact that the ISS is closer to its end than its beginning. At some point, this decades-old outpost will need to be deorbited over the Pacific Ocean to be safely disposed of, ending one of the last legacies of the space shuttle program. Should no replacement be ready in time, a destination gap could have devastating consequences on the commercial space industry, but could also hurt NASA and others' ability to do research in low Earth orbit. And because the ISS cannot last forever, there are plans to replace the capability of the massive outpost with one or more smaller habitats through the commercial low Earth orbit destinations program. Overall, this is part of a larger trend by NASA to commercialize space that began as early as 2006 with the Commercial Orbital Transportation Services program, which helped SpaceX and then Orbital Sciences develop Dragon and Cygnus, respectively. COTS gave way to the Commercial Resupply Services program, which has been sending supplies, equipment, and science to the ISS regularly since 2012. And with the latest iteration of the CRS contract, a third company, Sierra Space, is working to develop a cargo variant of its Dream Chaser space plane to service the orbiting laboratory. COTS and CRS ultimately led to the commercial crew program. As of now, SpaceX's Crew Dragon is sending astronauts to and from the ISS 
on regular crew rotation missions. A second spacecraft, Boeing's CST-100 Starliner, is expected to begin services in 2023 after a troubled development process. There are other commercial aspects to the ISS, too. In fact, many of the U.S. experiments at the outpost are managed by the ISS U.S. National Lab, which is run by the Center for the Advancement of Science in Space, a nonprofit organization. Through the ISS National Lab, companies such as NanoRacks, Made in Space, and BioSurf are able to send experiments to the outpost on behalf of customers, be they commercial, governmental, or educational. NanoRacks in particular has made a really big mark on the ISS. Not only does that company have hardware inside the outpost for research, it has external hardware to host experiments in the vacuum of space. Moreover, NanoRacks even has its own private experiment airlock, which can be used to both expose research into space or deploy CubeSats away from the ISS. But since the ISS might have only a decade left for reliable operations, NASA is looking at several options to replace the capabilities of this multi-billion dollar outpost. Details of NASA's low Earth orbit commercialization plans began taking form in 2019. The effort was split into three stages, a near-term, mid-term, and long-term. The first stage encompasses the near-term goals. This would be for things like offering, for a price, access to a percentage of NASA's ISS capabilities for various activities. NASA established a pricing scheme for situations ranging from crew time to cargo used. There's even a cost sheet for private astronaut missions that accounts for food, trash, power, crew time, etc. The first company to take advantage of this is slated to be Axiom Space, which is contracted with SpaceX to send four private astronauts aboard a Crew Dragon spacecraft to the ISS in the first quarter of 2022. That's this year. This 10-day mission is the first of two the company has planned this year, both of which will utilize Crew Dragon. However, Axiom Space has bigger plans. They are also under contract with NASA to develop one or more commercial modules to be added to the front of the ISS. This Axiom segment is expected to have the ability to be fully independent of the current ISS subsystems as they plan to eventually detach the multi-module segment when the ISS nears its end. This commercial segment is actually the midterm stage for NASA's commercialization plans. The Axiom Space Outpost is expected to be able to allow more commercial activity to take place at the ISS. When the time comes for the ISS program to end, it is hoped the Axiom segment will be able to detach to form an independent free-flying space station with many of the capabilities of the venerable outpost. The company is already hard at work on its first modules and expects to fly at the first completed module as early as 2025. Axiom's station is expected to ultimately have two main modules to support crews and research, a dedicated research and manufacturing module, a large cupola-style window, and a power tower to expand environmental, life support, storage, and payload capabilities. The whole thing could be completed before the ISS is ready to retire. In the meantime, NASA is now working on its long-term stage in commercialization called Commercial Low Earth Orbit Destinations, which aims to have one or more private space stations in independent orbits. The three companies chosen in December 2021 were Blue Origin and its Orbital Reef concept, NanoRax and its StarLab outpost, and Northrop Grumman and its Cygnus-based design. Under the first phase of the contract, these three companies are expected to receive $130 million, $160 million, and $125.6 million, respectively, through about 2025 to further mature designs. The hope is for NASA to select one or more to fund through orbital activation by as early as 2027. While a lot is unknown about these three proposals, including costs, here's what we do know. Perhaps the most ambitious of the three is Blue Origin's orbital reef concept. In partnership with Boeing, Sierra Space, Red Wire Space, Genesis Engineering, and Arizona State University, Blue Origin is proposing a mixed-use space business park that can be expanded as demand arises. The baseline outpost is expected to include a large core module, a node with multiple docking ports for expansion, an energy mast, and an inflatable module and a science module. The diameter of the core module appears to be larger than that of the 4.5 meter diameter modules of the International Space Station and would likely launch atop Blue Origin's new Glenn rocket. Orbital Reef would be serviced by Boeing's Starliner and Sierra Space's Dream Chaser for both crew and cargo. Additionally, Genesis Engineering is looking to provide a single-person spacecraft for external operations and potentially tourist excursions. Arizona State University, meanwhile, would provide the research advisory services as well as public outreach. In the future, Orbital Reef is being designed to be able to expand, potentially having a pressurized volume comparable to that of the ISS and be able to support up to 10 people. NanoRack's Star Lab, on the other hand, is probably the most pragmatic. 
Its relatively simple design is expected to be launched on a single rocket. It includes a main 340 cubic meter inflatable habitat, which is to be built by Lockheed Martin. It'll also feature a 60 kilowatt power and propulsion element, a robotic arm, as well as external platforms for experiments. It also looks to have at least two docking ports. The inflatable portion is called the George Washington Carver Science Park, which is named after the famed American agricultural scientist. Inside will be four main departments, a biology lab, a plant habitation lab, a physical science and materials research lab, and an open workbench. NanoRax hopes to be able to launch a star lab as early as 2027 and for it to be continuously crewed by four astronauts. Finally, Northrop Grumman's unnamed proposal is based on flight-proven hardware, such as the company's Cygnus cargo resupply spacecraft. According to NASA, it is expected to initially include a base module with multiple docking ports for expansion to support crew analog habitats, laboratories and airlocks, as well as facilities that can produce artificial gravity. Like Orbital Reef, it can be expanded as demand grows. Partnered with Northrop Grumman on this station is Dynetics, with other partners expected to be announced in the future. In short, the goal by the end of this decade is for NASA to be able to purchase research and development time as well as services from private providers at a lower cost than what is currently being spent on the ISS program. As of right now, NASA spends nearly $4 billion a year on operations, including crew and cargo transportation. This could potentially free up billions of dollars for NASA's Artemis program by the end of the decade, which could be used to accelerate the agency's plans to send humans to Mars in the 2030s. What's amazing is, by the end of this decade, there could be as many as three or four orbiting research platforms and several government-operated outposts, including the Chinese Tiangong space station. And that doesn't even include the possibility of a deep space outpost flying around the moon, as well as a potential lunar surface base at the South Pole. It's an exciting time for human spaceflight and the potential destinations for humans to visit for research, exploration, and even tourism. Let me know what space station you are most excited to see built and flown. And do you think other countries, such as India, will get to the point of putting up their own space station? Let me know in the comments below. And if I've earned it, it'd mean the world to me if you could subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and share this video with friends and family. It helps support the channel, but also lets me know what topics you're all interested in regarding human space exploration. If you'd like to take a couple extra steps to help support Orbital Velocity, there's a link to my Patreon page in the description below. Finally, be sure to follow Orbital Velocity on Twitter and Facebook. You can also visit orbital-velocity.com for even more space-related content. Links are in the description below. Thanks again for watching, and until next time, Ad Astra.